Welcome to Wild Development Studio. Join us as we venture into the breathtaking realm of wildlife arts and untamed adventures. With captivating stories from the field and ideas to dive into the visual arts, we'll ignite your passion for conservation. Get ready to develop something wild. Welcome to Wild Developments. You're in the right place if you want a heartfelt connection with nature through the visual arts and storytelling. If you've been curious about picking up photography, today's episode is for you. We have John Butler on the show, who's been a professional photographer since 1992, based in Ontario, Canada. He also started a new video podcast called Butler's Babble, where the mission is to help inspire people who've been down on their lives and help change their lives for the better. Well, a very wild welcome, John. Thank you for being here today. No, thank you for inviting me. So you're a photographer. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in that field? I actually fell into the field. I actually, growing up, going through school and high school, I wasn't going to be a photographer. I didn't even own a camera. I think the only camera I owned back then, and of course, we're going back to the 70s and 80s now, was when we went on school trips, my parents went and bought me this little camera. It was probably about that big. So not not much bigger than a credit card. And it was a disc camera, as they called it. And you would go and buy these little discs that you open the back and you put the disc in and close it. And you go and you shoot and you get maybe 12 pictures on a disc or 15. And then when you're finished, you would pop the disc out and go get that developed. And it almost looked like, do you remember those old Viewmaster camera oh, yeah. things that used to it almost looked like those little Viewmaster things. That's how your negatives came back. They were just little teeny things all the way in a circle around on this disc. And then they would print from that. And that was my very first camera, but I had no desire to be a photographer. I was actually going to be a rock and roll drummer back then. Because <laughs> back in the 80s, I had the long hair and everything. Now I have no hair. Um, but yeah, I, I went through high school and I uh, was going to be an actual rock and roll drummer. And I actually went to a one-year prep course in college in Toronto there uh, for music. And after that um, year was over, I decided that music wasn't what I wanted to do for school. I just wanted to play for fun. So I actually transferred into a course called audiovisual. It used to be called audiovisual communications. I think at that time they had just changed it to audiovisual technician or something like that. And they taught you everything from photography 101, um, TV studio 101. Uh, they had scripting, they had slideshows and that, because back then, of course, there was no computers. Mm -hmm. This is a film day. So if you wanted to do like a slideshow, like the people do online now, and you're doing a presentation for a company, they would teach you how to use multiple slide projectors side by side, where they would all go to the same spot and they would fade from one to the other. And you had to learn all that. So I went in there for that and it made me buy a camera and because there was a photography part to that class. And I did one semester and I said, you know what, school is not for me. And I dropped out. So I was a college dropout. And, uh, but I had this camera, I had an old Minolta X370N, I think it was called. And, uh, with this MagnaCon, what was it? Something like 75 to 300 or 75, 200 lens that came with just an old kit lens, really cheap. I got a like wax camera, this camera and this lens. Um, and I had it sitting around the house and I got a job at a bodybuilding and fitness store out of Toronto called Muscle Mag International, which was a, a an international magazine for bodybuilders that you would see on the newsstands. And he had a women's fitness magazine called Oxygen Women's Fitness. And I started working at the head office there, just doing a normal nine to five job, warehouse, mail room, that kind of stuff. And he used to fly in every now and then um, bodybuilders and uh, fitness models you would see in these magazines into the store for a weekend called it the star weekend. And people would come to see these people that you see in the magazines all the time, get autographed pictures from them, get um, maybe diet, diet tips or working out tips and that. And they would be there to sign autographs. And I just happened to show up one day with my camera and said, Oh, I'll just go and check it out and take some pictures. And I showed up and started taking some pictures and went and got the film developed because my boss is like, well, Hey, if you get some good images, maybe I can use them for the, the write up in an article. And I said, okay, didn't think anything of it. Got my role developed, got my pictures back, uh, all little four by six prints from the negatives. And I just handed them to him. So here you go. Here's what I got. And he ended up taking one image of himself with three of the fitness models and bodybuilders he brought and um, ended up using that in the article. And he paid me like $25 for that picture. And I thought, hey, that's kind of cool. Because back then you buy a roll of film, it was what, $10? And then another 15 to develop it or vice versa. 
So it's about $25 for like 24 shots. And I thought, well, he just paid me the whole roll film and developing costs for one image. If I can get good at this and sell five, six, 10 images off of a roll, I could make some good money off of this. So just started getting how to videos and some books and self teach myself and just went from there. And that's how I got into photography. And then I started getting the bug and falling in love with it to the point where that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a photographer. So I kind of just lucked into it kind of. Do you like film better or do you like digital? What's the pros and cons? I, I do like film better in some ways because I was one of the last ones of the film era probably to, come over to digital because I know digital was starting in the early 2000s and it took me till about uh, sometime in 2005 until I finally decided to get on the wagon of digital because I figured it's not going anywhere. I better get on this wagon. So um, I still love the look of film when it's developed and printed. I think it looks more authentic. It looks m more real, if that makes sense. Um, the difference also is back then we could do more specializing, I found, because you were either a portrait photographer, you were a landscape photographer, you were a, a wedding photographer. You can specialize in what you wanted to do more. Um, whereas when digital came out, all of a sudden everybody was getting a camera. And now in order to keep a business going, you had to get into everything. So you were shooting weddings, but you're also shooting portraits and you're doing family portraits and you're doing sports. And yet you're trying to do everything, as my friend Rob would say, the army Swiss knife in photography, <laughs> trying to do everything. And, um, so it ended up being more work sometimes. Um, and when digital came in, now you were not just a photographer, but you were also the dark room too, because now you're using Photoshop mm -hmm. to work on your images. And in the old days, I mean, you would take your film, go drop it off at the lab, wait for it to be ready. You pick it up and there's your images right there. So, um, now we're everything. The only thing I don't do right now in house is printing for my clients. I have a professional lab that I send it to, to get that done. But, um, but yeah, I think, um, I prefer the look of film, but when it comes to workflow and getting your own personality more into the images and just the speed of getting them back to your clients and that digital is definitely better that way. Um, but I still, I do miss film and, uh, but I'm not willing to go back right now. Do you feel that you had to stop and be more intentional with film? Yes, because um, nowadays, I mean, you can get memory cards for your camera that are gigabytes of storage for like cheap, 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 less than a hundred bucks, of course. Whereas I remember when digital first came out back when I got my first one in 2005 for that, I think it was 128 megabyte um, yeah. card was about 50 bucks and when they came out with 256 gig cards, they were $150 and they were going up there. And then as soon as they came out with the one gig card, we were like, whoa, that's going to get a lot of storage in there, but you're paying like $350 for this card. So it was, it was getting, uh, it gets, um, um, in that way, it was cheaper though, still because film, when you would go shoot a wedding, you had to be a little bit more frugal on how many pictures you took. It's not like the kids nowadays with the digital where there's just like rapid fire and then oh, I'll just go edit them in Photoshop and take the ones that I don't want. Whereas in film, you didn't do that. It was expensive because you had to buy those rolls of film and there were 24 or 36 rolls of film. So you only got 24 to 36 shots per roll. And if you're buying 10 rolls of film and it's costing you hundreds of dollars to buy that and develop it with pro film, you are being a little bit more selective because you're only getting about 300 shots out of that. So, um, it was a little bit more, you did have to stop and think about it and, and be a little bit more um, truthful on what you were going to shoot and had get your lighting and things like you had to get it right in the camera as much as possible because you didn't have the back of the screen there to look at, to see if you got the shot. Mm -hmm. So um, you couldn't be lazy, put it that way, if you wanted <laughs> to make it. Yeah. What's your favorite subject to shoot? You've done, you said bodybuilders, weddings, real estate. What's your favorite subject? I think right now in my stage of my life, I just turned 51 in August and um, I I'm a portrait photographer to heart. I mean, I'm a people photographer. I love shooting people. Um, I don't shoot weddings anymore. I stopped doing that about six years ago. I just started losing the fun for it and, and the passion for it. But I do love doing portrait work, uh, whether it be more contemporary portraits. I love doing um, headshots and business portraits for my business clients. I do a lot of corporate work. I love going on location with my 
uh, corporate stuff and doing uh, on location branding shots and headshots on location as opposed to just doing them in the studio. Um, but I am more of a portrait people photographer. I like having that control too. I use my studio lights all the time, even outdoors. Um, I like to control the light, not uh, just let the camera or the lights do it for me. I like to know that I'm getting what I want. So I'm more of a people photographer. I'm not as much of a, um, I don't do babies anymore. Um, I'm not a newborn photographer. So I would say more portrait work, such as corporate stuff and um, contemporary portraits and family portraits, things like that. And that's not as easy as it sounds like you need to be able to get the best out of that person so that they've got a good headshot and they want to come back to you and recommend you to other people. Do you have any secrets that you can share about how to like, I don't know, get somebody to relax and get a, a good picture out of them? Well, I find, yeah, I would say just don't start right away. When they come in, I get clients that come in, um, they come in the front door, I greet them. Tell them, hey, come on, bring your stuff to the back there, to the lounge there, where they can put it in the change room and hang up their stuff. Um, I tell them we have coffee night here. If you want to sit and have a quick coffee first, or a lot of times I'll say, if you want, when we're done, you have coffee, whatever here. I try not to do it beforehand because you don't want them to get coffee tongue or <laughs> um, or they have little. We have little candies there on the table there, and I'm like, you eat one of those little candies, you're gonna get a green tongue or a blue tongue. So we try and keep a lot of it. just drink water or something if you want. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a little change room area there. And then we have the hair and makeup. So we we basically get them to relax, just come on in first, we're not going to throw them right in front of the camera right away. And a lot of people will do that. They'll, the customer gets there, or they get to where the client is. And as soon as they show up, they're like, Okay, I'm going to shoot you over here. And if you want to go stand over there, and then boom, they're ready to shoot. And by then, there's a lot of times they're nervous. These are people that don't like to be in front of the camera. A lot of times, I don't know how many times I'm sure you've got it too, where people will come up to you and say, Oh, I hate having my picture taken. Yeah. So it's my job to relax them, get them in front, get them used to just talking to me, talk with me a little bit. And then I use a tripod still. I find a lot of people don't like using tripods. It's too cumbersome. But to tell you the truth, if you want to relax your client, I say use a tripod because you can put the camera on there, you get it all set up and then Lift your head away from the camera with your hand on, and then just talk to them and get, okay, turn this way and shoot them. Okay, so what did you do last night? Did you guys have fun last night, you and your husband or your wife or whatever? Or, oh, yeah, what, what kind of interests are you? And talk to them back and forth as you're shooting because they're more relaxed now. They're just having a conversation. And they're like, okay, look over here, smile this way. Okay, show me some teeth. Okay, so, yeah, how, how's your son doing in school? And like, just talk to them because mm -hmm. there's nothing more intimidating than sitting there with a person with a camera just up like this and this big huge lens circle thing in front of you and you're like okay turn this way look this way it's so impersonal so how are you going to get a beautiful shot of these people when they're nervous they're anxious and all they're seeing is this big eye looking at them and uh, <laughs> so get away from the back of the camera that's my my own personal opinion is get it on a tripod get it set up and then just come above it and just start talking to them and just shoot. You'll get a lot better pictures that way. They'll be more relaxed and they'll have a lot more fun too. Cause you want to give them an experience. You don't want to just take their picture. Walmart can go and take their picture. Well, that's selfie. Studios. So yeah, somebody can... selfie. Anybody can take a picture, but yeah. can you take a photograph? To me, there's a big difference. Absolutely. So, and you're really adding the humanity back into it too. Exactly. Because you got to remember these people are going to use this image. If it's like for a business portrait, they're using this image to sell themselves and to make money. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure it's the best image possible that they can have because this is their livelihood and they want to make money. So, and a lot of times that photograph that they're going to see is their, the person, their client's first impression of who they are. So you want to get who they are properly and professionally and make them look like that's the person I want to hire. So get them relaxed, have some fun and make it fun for everybody. And you'll get better pictures that way. I was going to ask about the power of photography, but you just kind of explained it right there. I mean, there's a difference <laughs> between a photo and a photograph. Exactly. Anybody can take a photo, but can you take an actual professional image or photograph in my, my person? Do you have a favorite photograph from like National Geographic or something like that, that just really pulls at your heartstrings or just, it's going to be something you always remember? I don't know about National Geographic because I never really read that as a kid. I do still remember that iconic one. Everybody talks of that Afghan girl, close up headshot of that yeah. Afghani girl that, uh, that, and that's funny because I think it was a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken, somebody had showed a picture of that Afghani girl years later. And, um, 
But I think that's the only one I really know. So it shows how iconic a picture can be that even if you're not into that kind of thing, you still remember a certain thing from that. I still remember, I can picture it right now, right now with those sad eyes looking into the camera. Um, I'm more of like a Vanity Fair type um, of magazine because I was a very big, I don't know if anybody's heard of Annie Leibovitz, but I was a big fan of her photography. She was uh, oh, yeah. back in the, I think, 60s too, but the 70s, she was a big main photographer for Rolling Stone magazine for a long time. And then uh, she transferred going to Vanity Fair, did all their covers. You'd see all the celebrity covers of like Arnold Schwarzenegger on the horse with the cigar. And a lot of times when you see these covers, I don't know if she shoots much for them anymore, but she used to be their head photographer at one point. And just some of the iconic photos that she would take is just amazing. So those were my favorite ones because I was a magazine photographer. So I loved magazines and stuff. So Annie Leibovitz photography and Vanity Fair magazines are the ones that stand out for me the most. Do you find that working for a magazine, is that a hard area to be in or like once you're in, you're in? I'm it is hard. It's harder. Yeah, it is hard. I was always the new guy on the block, no matter how long I was doing it because I didn't do it. I wasn't working at the magazine as a photographer. I was there doing a normal nine to five job. I did the photography on the side and then I would submit my images to the boss and say, here, buy these. And um, sometimes he would, sometimes he wouldn't. But uh, the problem with mine is when I was a magazine photographer, it was for bodybuilding and fitness magazines and I live in Canada. So um, we get the four seasons, of course, where I was competing with photographers from California and Florida that were in the summer with the beaches all year round. So when you're doing swimsuit photography, um, unless you're paying for trips to California or Florida or somewhere where there's a nice weather in the middle of December to do photo shoots, because the magazines, they don't have time to wait for summertime. They want the images that they need for their magazine issues. So a lot of times they'd be contracted out to the guys in California and stuff like that, Venice Beach, uh, Santa Monica area, which is known as Muscle Beach. And uh, models would get flown there to shoot with them. Um, and so I was always competing and uh, with ones that were actual magazine photographers. I was a freelance photographer that submitted my images. And um, so trying to get your word out there because um, you can't just call up somebody and say, hey, I'm a photographer, can I take your picture? You had to have some credentials and show them, say, hey, so-and-so gave me your name. I'd like to do a shoot for you and try and see if we can get it into Muscle Mag or Oxygen or um, Muscle and Fitness Magazine or Flex Magazine, things like that. And uh, they had to go by your name and reputation. So it, it, it was hard and it's hard keeping it up because things change all the time and styles change. Nowadays, everything's online. So there's online magazines. There's not as many physical magazines anymore, especially in the bodybuilding industry. There's only like two or three of the main ones and the rest have all gone online or just folded up completely. So um, I haven't done magazine work probably since early 2000s was the last time I did it. So it's been about 20 years. Oh, wow. And do you feel that AI is going to change photography at all? It already has. Um, the problem with people out there now I'm finding is... Um, and it happens with all parts of photography is when something new comes in, oh, that's going to kill photography now. Or photographers, are, they're, they're dead and in the water now. Nobody needs a photographer anymore. I think photographers are always going to be needed. Same with videographers and that. I think when some of this new technology comes out, what you have to do is you have to realize, how can I use this technology to my advantage for mm -hmm. my clients and make it work for me, for my clients, as opposed to fighting it and saying, Oh, what am I going to do to tell my clients? Oh, you don't need that. This is better. And so just take the technology. I mean, remember film when, um, back in the film days, if you were a wedding photographer or working for magazines, you were using two and a quarter size negatives, medium format cameras. And that if you were, had a little 35 millimeter camera, it wasn't good enough. And then as film through the nineties started getting better and better quality, um, all of a sudden wedding photographers were all using 35 millimeter cameras because it was lighter and easier to use and move around and do more of a journalistic style. Um, and then as you got into the early 2000s and digital was coming out, everybody was fighting that. Oh my God, that's never going to take on. That's that's never going to work. And um, it took us a long time, some people, to finally realize, you know what? Film's not staying. It, digital's taking over and it's going to... so. I'm going to have to get on that bandwagon. So then you get on that bandwagon, you start shooting that. And then uh, about 10 years ago, um, a new thing started coming out with what's called hybrid cameras or mirrorless cameras as instead of the DSLRs. 
And everybody's like, oh, that's never going to take on and they're never as good quality. And now almost every professional photographer, not everyone, but a lot of them are now using mirrorless cameras because I know I just upgraded last year to mirrorless. I still have my DSLRs, um, but the mirrorless are just lighter. They're um, a lot easier to use and they take some stuff out of the photographer's hands so that you can control more of the creative side and be more creative with it. The focusing systems are way better. My eyes are not as good as they used to be when I was younger. So I, I can rely on that camera to take a sharp image while I can control the lighting and the creative side of it. So now that AIs come out, people are, again are all freaking out and they're like, oh my God, that's the end of photography. And it's like, well, no, you just got to learn how to, you can use it to your advantage and use it to enhance your photographs and make something even better for your clients. So instead of fighting it, learn how to use it properly and use it with your business. And, and I think everybody will be fine. Photographers are going to be needed no matter what. And photography is here to stay still. So. Yeah, there's still, I mean, looking at some of the AI, it's, I, I saw a dolphin with an extra fin. I'm like, I yeah. can't believe people are believing that this is a real image, but I, there's just something about the humanness of photography and, mm -hmm. and capturing what is real. I mean, for scientific purposes alone, we need to know what things actually look like. Exactly. You're still going to need somebody to control all that stuff too. It's not going to just do it on its own. So you still got to tell it what you want it to do. And where it's hurting the most, I think at the beginning right now, or where it might give it another year or two is in the headshot industry, because nowadays um, you're looking at these websites popping up on um, with advertisements on Facebook and things like that, where you can send a selfie from your cell phone mm -hmm. to these companies. And for $30, they'll make, 20 headshot images for you. And then they go and they do all the makeup on there for you. And they put the backgrounds in there for you. And they send you like 20 images and some of them look fantastic. I, I'm not going to get you wrong, but there still is a way to go because some of them you look at them and it's like, no, that does, doesn't even look like the person or it doesn't look yeah. realistic or it's not there yet, but you give it some time like any other technology and it's going to get there and it could some ways do that, but there's still going to be, people out there that want a photographer. They don't want AI. They want that personality of photographer. They want the experience. And a big corporate guy is not going to hire somebody to go and get all these selfies from his employees to get their images for their <laughs> website. They're still going to have a photographer probably come in and shoot everybody and get beautiful images and not have to rely on AI. So there still is going to be work out there. It's just a matter of uh, establishing yourself and, and being the one that they want to call basically. But uh but yeah, technology is always going to be going and you just got to learn how to use it to your advantage. Yeah. And so if somebody wanted to get involved with photography, they they want to get away from maybe a cell phone camera, they want to pick up their first actual camera. What are some tips that you would have for somebody just starting out? One thing, um, learn the camera. Um, there's so many people that either for Christmas or their birthdays or just for themselves, get this nice little camera from whether it be Staples or a photography store, a beautiful camera that's $1,000, $1,500, $2,000, whatever, and then they put it on automatic and let the camera do everything for them. And it's like you're wasting all that technology. Mm -hmm. Cameras, I always say, are stupid. They are smart in ways, but the, technically they're stupid because they don't know what's in your head and what kind of image you want to take. So you've got to tell it what to take. And if you just put it in automatic, it's just reading the scene, going through all this thousands or millions of images that are in their memory, of trying to find scenes that are similar to it and then trying to adapt to that. That's how the memory of the camera works. Um, but when it comes to say you want the person in focus and the background out of focus, it doesn't know that it just sees a scene. It's going to take a picture and make it the best picture it can. So learn what um, your camera can do. Learn apertures, learn ISOs, learn shutter speeds, how they work and how they work together to get the image you want. Um, so just learn that. And um, don't be afraid to go on YouTube. I mean, there's so many tutorials nowadays on YouTube. You can find anything on anything on there. Um, but don't don't take what they say as gospel because every photographer is different. And they have their own kind of things that they say. Just take bits and pieces that work for you and and incorporate those. Um, and if that's perfect if you're just doing it as a hobby or you're getting into being an amateur. But if you're going to want to do professional-wise and actually run a business, you can learn photography yourself on YouTube, things like that. But 
I would say if you're going to go to school, instead of taking a photography class, and all the photography schools are going to hate me for this, but <laughs> I would rather you go and take a business course as opposed to a photography course because you can learn photography on your own. Mm -hmm. But I know so many photographers are phenomenal photographers and they take wicked photographs and, but they, their business goes under within the first five years because they don't know how to run a business. They don't know how to worry about taxes and all that kind of stuff. So if you're going to do it as a business, take a business class, learn the business side and then learn the photography yourself or go to photography school after that, if you want, but learn the business side. But if it's just for your own self, YouTube channels, um, self-help type stuff on there is awesome, but learn the camera itself and just experiment, get out there and shoot. You're never going to learn if you're not shooting. If you're just sitting there watching me or you do a tutorial and that's all you do, you're never going to learn. You're just going to absorb it, but nothing. Get out there and shoot, shoot, shoot. The more you shoot, the better you're going to get. And then they start to develop their own sense of style too and exactly. stand out from other photographers. Exactly. I mean, you could take my advice on what to do for portraits, take your advice on what to do for wildlife and things like that, but don't copy us. Take what we say, incorporate it into your style, and then come out with your own style, like you said. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great tips. So I know you don't focus on wildlife photography often, but do you like getting outside and using your camera out when you're hiking? Or I know Canada's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you like shooting outside at all? I did when I was younger. And um, like, I still shoot like shooting outside, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to like doing stuff like going hiking and shooting, and stuff, I don't do it as much anymore. I remember once uh, my friend back home and in my twenties, he invited me out to a fishing trip because they, him and a, uh, a couple of our other buddies were big fishermen and I could never get into fishing. I don't know. It's just not me. I can't sit there and just throw a rod in there and wait there for 15, 20, half an hour, an hour for something to bite. Um, so that wasn't for me. So I actually brought my camera on the little boat too. And so while they were fishing with their rods in there, I had a camera and I was just taking pictures and stuff. So back then I really enjoyed it, but, uh, I, I found with that kind of photography, I wasn't very good at it. And um, not that I didn't know how to do it. It's just, I didn't find, I had the eye that some landscape photographers do. Um, but um, I, I think I've got my craft to a point that if I had to go out there and do some, I could do a decent work. Um, but um, I find more when it comes to outside, I'd rather just go outside and take portraits of somebody, um, mm -hmm. do, do an actual portrait session. Not as much landscape. I do some here and there. Um, and don't be afraid to even just walk around with this camera if you have to, because it's not going to get you the best work in that. But I mean, these take phenomenal pictures these days. And I always say the best camera that you can use is the one you have with you at the time. Yeah. Because the cell phone. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes the camera's on there and I've had some pictures of landscapes in my area here where I just happen to see it. And it's like, wow, that's gorgeous. And I pull my phone out and I take a couple different shots and then later on can put them on here and, and edit them. And, put them on Facebook and people never knew I took it with my cell phone for all they know. I used a big camera. They don't care as long as they see the image like that. Wow. That's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, there are so, some places around here that are changing their contests to having a, a cell phone photography yep. uh, category. I mean, otherwise you're missing out on some great shots. Yeah. I had a friend of mine who took a picture with his iPhone back about six years ago. Uh, his wife took a picture with their iPhone of their cottage in the middle of winter with all the snow and everything. And they loved it so much. And his anniversary was coming up and he asked me, can I try and get this where I can get a nice print off of it? Even though it was from a cell phone, I was able to make it on Photoshop for him where it was actually already a great exposed image. And that, so I didn't have to do much to it, fix the contrast a bit and the colors. And I was able to print an 11 by 14 enlargement for him, have it framed for him with no problem. And when you looked at it on the wall, you would think it was taken with a DSLR or something. You never even know that was taken with a cell phone. So nice. as long as you know how to use light and how to use a camera, you can get some phenomenal pictures no matter which camera you're using, whether it's a cell phone, a uh, big expensive camera, anything. Just just go out there and have fun and shoot. Mm -hmm. So when you're taking uh, portraits of people, do you like natural light better? And it's probably a little bit more difficult to work in because everything's changing all the time. It is. I used to. I used to be totally like loving available. And I still do like a window light. I mean, nothing mimics it. It's beautiful light. But... I am more trained as a, an actual studio photographer. So I like using studio strobes um, because I can control them. Mm. The sun, I can't control. We can book a session for you to go outside and do a beautiful portrait session on a certain day. And that day it rained or something, or that day it's really cloudy as opposed to sunny, or it's really sunny. And I hate really sunny yeah. because it's so harsh. Now you got to put them in the shade or find some other way. 
I like to be in control. So I'm one of the only ones in my area that still has a light meter that I can take around and I can measure the light and stuff and set my camera. Because you remember as a, as a corporate photographer, when you get a CEO that needs his portrait taken, sometimes they only get, they, you only have two minutes to take his picture that he doesn't have the time to sit there and do a whole photo shoot. So you've got to get, whether it's outside, inside, whatever, you've got to get everything all perfectly with your assistant, ready to go, lighting, everything. So when he sits in front of you, you take one or two shots. Okay. I'm ready to go. And boom, you just shoot. And then 30 seconds to a minute later, they're dragging him away back to a meeting or to where he's got to go. So you got to be able to nail that shot. So uh, that's where I like control. Cause I know with my strobes, I know what I get even mm -hmm. outside portrait work. I take my strobes with me. I have battery powered Godox lights that I can take with me. And, um, they overpower the sun if I need to. And I can use the sun as a second light, maybe a back rim light or a hair light. Um, but so I, I think in the last maybe six, seven years, I prefer strobes and artificial light over regular light or available light. Um, but it depends on the situation. Um, sometimes you don't have time to set all that stuff up. So we'll just go outside and shoot and just know how the, how to use the sun to your advantage. So um, I don't know about you, but I prefer strobes myself. So I, well... I'm usually out with a big 600 millimeter lens and <laughs> <laughs> shooting a bear that's going by or an exactly. owl or whatever. Um, yeah, I you prefer... don't want to be close enough to a bear with a 200 millimeter lens. You want that long one so you're far enough away. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And the ones at uh, Smoky Mountains are, they don't have any fear of humans at all. <laughs> uh, so I know we had, we talked about a story. I don't know how to set this up without just saying it about perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's a great lesson for anybody that wants to dive into wildlife photography mm -hmm. or landscape photography. Can you tell us about that story? If I think I know what you're talking about, it's on the canoeing trip that I did. Um, mm -hmm. well, not canoeing trip, but it was, a my local town here, they did a photography class for people, um, that was paid for through the town where they just had me sort of show them how they can take landscape photos and get some beautiful pictures. And they had us going um, from the beach area that we were at, um, taking canoes or kayaks, whichever one you wanted to take. And we were taking it across to an island that wasn't too far. Um, over the, It was about a five-minute canoe ride or something like that, 10-minute canoe ride. So um, some of them were in kayaks, some in canoes. And then I had the guy who organized it in a canoe with me. So he was actually canoeing while I just had my camera in my hand. And uh, as we were going over to the island, which is basically where we were going to set up and, and I was going to teach them, halfway there, I was looking over at one angle this way. And um, and it was beautiful scenery with just the water. We had the different islands over there and the land over here. And the clouds were kind of in a little bit. and um, But it just had this, you thought you were in the Arctic almost. It was really bluish. Um it was getting lower. It was probably, I wouldn't say probably around 6 PM. And at that time of year, it was in the spring, I think, or it might've been the fall just before summer or as summer's ending, it was starting to um, get a little bit darker and it just was this gorgeous bluish sky and reflecting into the water. It just looked very cold, even though we were nice and warm. It was probably like, I don't know, 20 something degrees Celsius, which is what seventies or eighties. I guess 80s. Yeah. Uh, Fahrenheit. I, I, we'll um, do the math later. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I was just looking through there and it's like, that's gorgeous. And I just happened to pick my camera up and got it to the right settings and took one or two shots. I think two or three shots, something like that. And I looked at it, I'm like, okay, I got that. I'll have to see that in big and later on on the screen and see how it looks. So as we're driving, um, as I finished it and I looked at it, I said, okay, I picked my head up and I'm looking around and I just happened to look the other way. And it was funny because it was a total contrast by looking over this way. Now it was almost like you were in the South somewhere and the sun was setting and it was nice orangey yellow skies, almost like on fire type of thing. And then the sky was reflecting into the water and it was like black water almost with this reflecting sky. And you would have thought that this was a total different time of year and a different landscape altogether. And so I picked up the camera, I turned over and again, boom, 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 took a bunch of shots off. And later on, when I got home, I looked at all the images and I'm like, wow, these are so contrast. One was cold and blue, like you were in the Arctic. One was fiery orange and yellows and almost like you're in Florida at sunset or something. 
And I developed them all and I made them actually into a panoramic, both of them. So they weren't just a normal size. They were a 10 by 20 panoramic for both of them. And I actually had them printed and mounted on a board and framed in a black frame. They're actually sitting in my, our um, basement right now on the walls there in our rec room. And uh, both of them together, it was so contrast because it looked like I took two different pictures at two different times and two different landscapes. So I actually labeled them fire and ice because it was total contrast. And, nice. um, and it's gorgeous. I'll have to send them to you so you can see them because you haven't even seen them yet. So I'll have no. to send them to you. And uh, who knows, maybe on the podcast, if there's a way you can always put them in the comment section or something when I send them to you. or whatever Yeah, you I'll want. blog but, uh, about it and um, put it in the blog so people can see what you're talking about too. Even your background looks like fire and ice too. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. It's that old cinematic look that if you look in movie theaters now or when you go to watch a movie nowadays, um, they use a lot of teals and oranges um, to get mood across. The teals are the more colder, more... Um, more like a, like a warehouse or something like that or there, but then you get those bright on this side, the bright orange there. And it just, th that contrast and that you'll see that in a lot of movies nowadays, a lot of filmers and cinematic, even cinematic photography nowadays, they're starting to use the teals and blues against the oranges and yellows and that it's a, it's a very contrasty thing nowadays. Cause if you even look behind me here, you got the blue and te the teal there, but then you got the orange on the plants and stuff like that. It's just a matter of how you, the mood you want to get across. And so I feel nice and comfortable in here. It, it looks beautiful. Mine exactly. looks all chaotic. <laughs> no, it looks great. It shows you what you do, right? So yeah, exactly. So let me treat, think. Hmm. What do I want to ask you next? Everything got thrown off with me. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I have a tendency to babble. And so I go a little overtime with my my answers to the point where it probably answers a couple of your questions at once sometimes. Sometimes. And then sometimes it leads to more questions or like I've got several that I want to go to. This might but... turn into a three-part series or something. <laughs> That's right. Well, actually, you said babble. You've got uh, another podcast. Oh, that's right. Do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, I didn't even think of that. That that just came out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I do. It, and it's funny because it's nothing to do with photography whatsoever. Um it all started because of the pandemic, basically, when we all got March 2020, everything shut down, we're all stuck at home. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a total extrovert. I don't, I like to be out, I like to be doing stuff and hanging out with people and things. So to be shut down in a house for six, seven, eight months was not fun. So I would take to my laptop here and just turn the camera that's on your laptop on and just go onto Facebook and go live and say, Hey everybody, what's everybody doing? We're all locked down. I got my coffee here. What's everybody doing today? And we would just sit and talk for about, it end up going for like two, three hours. Sometimes people would log in cause they're all stuck at home too and bored. Mm -hmm. So we're just talking about different things, different topics would come out. And I remember after doing this for a week, we used to call it something like coffee time with John or something like that. It became just a, a daily thing. Okay. Tomorrow at noon, we'll do the same thing or whatever. But then uh, one day I was on and somebody logged in and we were talking everybody and, Somebody typed in the comment section, oh, there's that butler babbling again. And I thought, hey, that kind of has a catch to it. So I just kept that in the back of my mind for a while. And then um, later in like 2021, I started thinking, you know what? I'm enjoying doing this. I started, I got a little $50 microphone from a friend of mine from who had it on Amazon. And, um, and I started using uh, a little better camera at the time. And I just started coming on and started talking to people and just having some fun. And then eventually um, we all went back to work. Things were going on again. And I thought, you know, I enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. So I wonder if there's something I can do with that. And originally, originally it was going to be a photography stuff in that, which I do another photography podcast also. Um, I actually do two of them. But um, it became to where, what did I really want to do if I'm going to do a podcast? And I started thinking of the mental health issues that everybody was going through. Um, because mental health is a thing that's been going on forever, of course, but I think with the pandemic, it just really enhanced it. The mental health was going through the roof. So I thought, well, there's a lot of people going through stuff. I'm sure there's people that would love to tell their story. So I just reached out to people and said, hey, if I start this podcast, would you guys be willing to talk about your your stories? And they're like, definitely. So we started what was called Butler's Babble. And basically, we interview people from all over the world that have been through some sort of a trauma or downtime in their life. They've made their way through it or they're making their way through it. And now they want to share their stories with other people, hoping that they can help somebody else get through what they're going through. Because no matter what anybody's going through in life, 
there's probably been somebody that's been there or done that or going through it themselves at the same time. So it's a matter of getting it out there in front of the open, letting people talk about it. And hopefully by listening to what other people did to get through their traumas, it'll help them implement things in their life to get them through it and to make them live a better, stronger life. It doesn't matter what it is. And even if we can help one person from that podcast, to me, it's worth it. So um, we've done... We finished season one in December sometime, early December. We did like 19 episodes. And uh, actually about two days ago, we start, We recorded our very first episode of season two, which will be coming out in about a week or two. And I got one lined up next week and we got other people lined up. So season two will be starting up soon. So people just seem to love it and want to do it. So That's awesome. And I bet it's also comforting to people to know that somebody's gone through it and it's not going to be forever. No. You, you will eventually get on the other side and things will be better. It's definitely the way it is. And it's just a matter of showing empathy for people too, because you don't know what other people are going through. I mean, they always say the one who's smiling the most and looks the happiest and going through life awesome is probably the one you got to worry about and the one you should reach out to saying, hey, is everything okay? Because you look at people like um, Robin Williams. I was thinking um, that, yeah. I mean, this guy, you would never know what's going through mental health that he was going through. And uh I mean, you never know. So those are the people sometimes just reach out, even just to reach out, say, hey, how's it going? Haven't talked to you in a while. Is everything okay? Or um, what's new in your life? And that just to get that communication going uh, can help one person um, tremendously because you don't know what they're going through. That's a real, that's really important. And I'm going to tag all your podcasts and oh, ways people can find you in the show description. But if you want to go ahead and tell people how they can find you too, before we run out of time. Definitely. And I'm going to probably talk to you later about probably coming on one of my photography podcasts that we do too. So be fantastic. Um, we'll talk about that later too. So, um, but yeah, they can find me through Facebook. Um, there's the John Butler personal page, of course, but there's also the John A. Butler photography page. It was at this point that I got disconnected from John. We had quite a few weird technical difficulties. Even right now, I'm powering through trying to get this done with a cold. And I find that in life when stuff like this happens and you feel like you're trying to be silenced, then it's probably really important that the message gets out into the world. So when it cut out, John said to make sure that you get the middle initial A in John A Butler.com. His photography podcast is called No BS photo buzz and can be found at www.youtube.com at wizards of light butler's babble which is the podcast he was talking about at the end of the show is at youtube.com at butler's babble and you can also find butler's babble in audio versions through spotify apple podcast google podcast Amazon Music, and iHeartRadio. And I did not get a chance to ask John what advice he had for all of you to get out and connect with nature. But when he has me on his podcast, I will be sure to ask him then. So stay tuned for that. And until next time, get outside and see what develops. Thanks for joining Wild Development Studio. We hope this exploration into the world of wildlife arts and adventure has sparked a desire to get outside and connect with something wild. If you have an adventure that's awe-inspiring, don't hesitate to share. Click the link in the description to submit your story to have it featured on our show or be a guest. Until next time, keep connecting to the wild and see what develops. The views, opinions, and statements expressed by individuals during Wild Development Studio Productions do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Wild Development Studio or its affiliates. Participation in any activities, expeditions, or adventures discussed or promoted during our content may involve inherent risks. It is strongly advised that individuals conduct thorough research, seek professional guidance, and take all necessary precautions before engaging in any such activities. Wild Development Studio, its representatives, or employees shall not be held responsible for any injury, loss, damage, accident, or unforeseen incident that may occur as a result of participating in activities inspired by or discussed in our content. By choosing to engage with our content or act upon any information provided, individuals do so at their own risk and discretion.